So I believe uh, we might be going live on Facebook in a second, and we should be also live on Instagram. Okay, Osei. All right, well, uh, uh, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Osei Desir and I'm a Palestinian physician uh, currently in Texas. And uh, uh, today we're gonna um, spend the next one and a half hours uh, talking about uh, the uh, current uh, ongoing uh, genocide in, in Gaza and what's, uh, what's happening, especially on the surgery side. And uh, today we have uh, some of the um amazing incredible surgeons and uh, anesthesiologists uh, from across the globe um who are joining us spending uh, their time to talk about their experience either going to uh, gaza or just coming back recently from it or advocating from uh, um, from far uh, for gaza and and other oppressed nations uh, across the globe um we're going to start with dr osama hamid dr osama hamid he's one of actually my mentors who I had the honor of meeting in, in Jordan, he's a consultant general surgeon. He was trained in the U.S. and uh, in, now in Jordan. He's the former governor of the American College of Surgeons uh, Jordan chapter. He just returned from Gaza. He spent a month at the Laqsa Hospital in the middle of uh, Gaza in Deir el-Balah. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Abdullah Aqli, who is a consultant and physiologist in Jordan, who also spent a month with Dr. Osama. Uh, at the same hospital. Um, and then Dr. Um, Hani al Qadi, who's a trauma and acute care surgeon trained in Canada, and he's now in Oman. And he's done a lot of work uh, for the to improve trauma care in the Middle East. And finally, uh, Dr. Qali Hussein, uh, she's a trauma and acute care surgeon in Arizona, and one of very few, unfortunately, vocal surgeons, uh, you know, uh, on social media about Palestine and other injustices across the globe. Um, so we're going to start with Dr. Osama Hamid. Uh, he's going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, he's going to share a, a presentation about the cases that he's seen. He's treated himself. Really complex uh, traumatic injuries. Um, we're going to interrupt him for uh, you know a few times to kind of discuss uh, some of these cases. And then Dr. Um, uh, Abdullah Aqli is going to pr present for about 10 minutes and then we'll open the floor for discussion. Dr. Osama, the floor is, is yours. Thanks, uh, Usaid, uh, and thanks uh, uh, my colleagues on the panelists uh, and my, my friend and partner, Abdullah. Thank you very much for everyone. And also would like to introduce Usaid for you guys. Usaid is a great uh, uh, surgery resident right now. He has done a lot of work. He's going into plastic reconstructive surgery, hopefully down the road. He's done a lot of work to help uh, the people in Palestine uh, and the people of Gaza. Thanks, Usaid, for being here. And I hope uh, we'll have a very uh, great uh, webinar trying to uh, show people what's happening on the ground. At the same time, uh, trying to uh, maybe uh, uh, have uh, some real answers uh, for what's happening next. So this is, again, what we have witnessed over one month period. Uh, this is the, a group of uh, physicians from Jordan. We actually went down, uh, went together through the Jordan uh, uh, Health Aid Society in collaboration with Project Hope. Our mission was from February 24th. Uh, we left Jordan and uh, we came back March uh, 20. I, I came back March 20th. Some people came back March 21st. So we were a group of two surgeons, one orthopedics, one anesthetist, one anesthesia technicians, and two are nurses, and then another a crew uh, from Project Hope also and the Jordan Health Associ Society came, uh, were a total for 15 individuals at Al-Aqsa Hospital at the same time, helping the people in Gaza. So again, in numbers, I'm sure most of you are following, we're now around 33 plus thousand people were killed and uh, uh, more than 75,000 were injured. So a lot of people have actually uh, criticized me for saying war injuries, and they said this is a genocide, it's not a war. So I think we just send the, the title and we stick to it. But again, yeah, I agree, this is a great, we all agree. And the International Court of Justice had uh, clearly stated that, that, that there is a very strong indication that what's happening in, just, in Gaza is genocide. And I hope 
this presentation could be taken as an evidence of justice uh, down the road uh, for uh, for the people of Gaza. More than 70% were children and women, and there's an 8,000 still missing under the rubble. So uh, attacks on healthcare in numbers, we have more than 370 attacks on healthcare facilities, uh, 476 healthcare personnel killed, physicians, nurses, technicians, 400 injured, 310 are detained and arrested, 155 healthcare facilities are affected, 32 hospitals out of 36 were damaged and now out of service. And basically only there's a four functioning hospitals in Gaza across the whole thing, uh, serving around two and a half million individuals. This is the last uh, uh, attack that we have all heard about, the Shifa Hospital Surgical Building, which actually was one of the largest uh, surgical buildings in Gaza. This is what happened after the Israeli army had invaded it and destroyed it completely just a few days ago. Uh, in addition, there's uh, people, uh, surgeons and physicians are still under arrest. Dr. Mohammed Abselmiye, for almost four months now, he was the director of the Shifa Hospital. Nobody knows anything about him. And our friend, uh, uh, Usaid Cousin Khalid Sir, he was uh, the only surgeon at Nasser Hospital. And also, uh, 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 he's now uh, been detained, and nobody knows anything about him for the last uh, few weeks. So our mission was in, at Al-Aqsa Hospital. It was in the center of Gaza, as you can see here. Uh, this is, was the only hospital in the, in the uh, middle area of Gaza, serving around 800,000 population. Typically, this hospital is a periphery hospital, small a hospital for the underserved. Uh, we have the north part that's served by Shifa Hospital as the main hospital, Kamal Udwan, Arantisi. And then the south, we have Nasser and the European Hospital, where the main two hospitals that also were uh, uh, the NASA hospital also was uh, damaged and it's out of service. So we have one hospital serving around 800,000 population. Now, in terms of the local surgical task force, our, our mission was try to really, you know, try to help the local uh, people of Gaza in terms of trying to uh, 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 provide them with as much support as possible. There were currently only four surgical consultants, three, three surgical specialists, four surgical residents, and 10 volunteer GPs. Uh, you have to understand that these people have been working uh, for ongoing for more than 180 days of this ongoing genocide, and 90% of them are actually refugees from other hospitals. So they're not uh, they're not part of this local system. So the majority were refugees from other places, and uh, they've been working for almost 180 days nonstop. In terms of the infrastructures, this uh, hospital that serves 800,000 population has only two full, full ORs functioning right now. One is them always booked for orthopedic cases, and one it's available for general vascular, spine, uh, and other other facilities. Uh, and then three delivery rooms that were converted to the operating room. As you can see, the one on the right. This is one of the OR. You see how small it is. You see there's no over over uh, ceiling lights. So this is this is what we have to operate in uh, for almost one month. In terms of numbers, out of this uh, thirty. Uh, 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 75,000 wounded in Gaza. You see Al-Aqsa Hospital had received almost 11,000 of them. So it's one of the very busy uh, hospitals and to receive uh, trauma as well as injuries, despite the uh, very limited infrastructures in terms of workforce as well as operating time and personnel. In terms of uh, uh, people who were murdered and killed by the Israeli army, again, around 50,000 had uh, uh, actually uh, sorry, uh, 4,000 uh, uh, in the Al-Aqsa hospital only. So it was one of the uh, largest hospitals to receive numbers of injuries and casualties. This is my uh, list that I uh, did personally. Uh, this was my personal list over uh, a month, around 30 cases of various uh, type of uh, injuries, around 20 primary cases. Uh, uh, most of them are gunshot wounds, explosive injuries and blast injuries, shrapnel injuries. Uh, eight cases of pre-exploration. We have two cholecystectomies uh, for perforated gallbladder. Again, elective cases are not done because of the limited OR time and personnel. So only top emergencies with peritonitis and had an average daily dressing of seven to 10 daily dressings per day. These are challenges to, to face uh, while you're doing uh, surgery uh, in, in, in Gaza. Uh, you have no CT abdomen pelvis are available on site. The only CT that can be done on site is only head. If you have to arrange CT abdomen pelvis, uh, you have to do it uh, only between 12 noon till 2 p.m. 
uh, in another facility where you have to arrange uh, transportation for the patient. So this was a big, big problem for us. So most of most of the time we we depended on serial fasts in a lot of cases to determine whether they need surgery or not. Uh, we have limited intervention radiology, only straightforward drains using chest tubes as a drain rather than actual big tail catheters. No endoscopy available. In terms of laboratory tests, we have only available hemoglobin, sometimes urea. People were run out of everything. And due to the siege that is limited on Gaza, nobody can get anything in. The WHO, the Red Cross, they really had problems getting anything in terms of medical supplies and in terms of medical uh, aids to the Gaza in general. So this is what we what we use to do. People have poor nutrition, as you can know, as you all know. Uh, a lot of people in Gaza, around a, a one million individual, according to the WFP program, are actually on the top of a, an imminent famine. So this is really uh, uh, very, and that's you you have large number of wounds, and this with this poor nutrition, you you get really a very very chance, a very limited chance for healing. In terms of medications, few antibiotics, not a lot of antibiotics. Cultures are very, very limited and few analgesics. We have a high rate of wound infections. My personal experience was around 85% wound infections on the cases that I've done. We had very, very poor post-operative care and limited ICU seats. My friend Abdullah will talk about uh, these issues uh, in details. So we were not safe. As you all know, uh, 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 Israeli army were, had attacked the MSF uh, uh, Doctor Without Borders, just the day we arrived Gaza on the February 21st. Uh, and we all heard about the attack uh, uh, at Al-Aqsa Hospital. As you can see here, this is where we used to walk in, and across the emergency department. This is the emergency room. And this is where we would be used, be sitting, uh, sometimes evaluating patients. So we were not safe. Uh, and you all heard about the uh, WCK uh, 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 workers, seven killed, just recently in the same area that we used to be in Deir al balah And again, the doctors without borders just the day before we entered Gaza. <clears throat> so this is my first case. This is my first case. Just walked into uh, Al-Aqsa Hospital, put my uh, uh, bags in, and they just called us to the operating room. We had a mass casualties, a tank missile into a house in Mawasi Khan Yunus. What we received in, in Shuhada Al-Aqsa Five-year-old boy, three-year-old uh, boy, his brother, and his cousin, four-year-old girl. His another cousin, six-year-old girl, were uh, shifted to European hospital. Father, brother, and cousin were killed in this attack. So he had a blast injury, and he had a mental evisceration out of his left flank. Upon exploration, we had found uh, a small uh, uh, DJ injury just at the DJ junction, as well as uh, a colon, uh, transverse colon injury, as well as splenic flexure uh, transsections. So you can see this is what we use in terms of flights to operate. Uh, we had, this is my, my partner, Dr. Muhammad Athamni. He was a great help and a great assist for me uh, over this uh, period. So I'm gonna show you a video of the actual uh, uh, actual images. This is again, my first case, just walking into Gaza. Uh, five years old, last injury. Uh, very, very extensive uh, injuries, okay, doctor. In a very, very bad injury involving in here a DJ junction. This is the duodenal jejunal junction. Very bad injury, blast injury. Another a small bowel injury horn. Multiple other small bowel injuries could have blast injuries. Okay. But then if you have a colonic injury horn, you have a colonic injury. But then if you have a colonic injury, you can have a little bit of then checking on evisceration from the retroperitoneum, evisceration from the retroperitoneum of the omentum. This is the whole. So this was again a very extensive injury to the DJ, uh, uh, partial injury to the transverse colon, and a full uh, injury to the splenic flexure in the in the colon. Major injury at the DJ junction, and we did proximal. Uh, Circulation level. We're going to fire stator here. This is a D junction. This is on top of the superior mesenteric artery, okay. as you can see there. The superior mesenteric artery, and the duodenal Okay, thank you. So after we did this resection, we did an end, an end to end. This is D2, and this is the uh, jejunum, retrocolic end to end, duodenal jejunal anastomosis. For the uh, for the transverse colon, uh, proximal transverse colon, we did primary repair, and for the splenic flexure, we did 
uh, 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 restriction and astomosis. So again, this patient had wound infection and he was discharged home after three weeks. And he was, uh, uh, I think I think he was a lucky one. And I was very happy to be there. Again, most people who know me, they know that this is a special interest for me, hepatobiliary and upper GI. And I'm very happy that I was there on that particular time and particular moment to manage his wound injury, which I believe it's one of the very complex injury any general surgeons can, can have. This is another, uh, this is one of the early cases that we get exposed to. Uh, as you can see, explosive injuries, uh, significant soft tissue damage in the lower limb and perineum. And basically this patient who took him to the operating room, extensive debridement, as well as colostomy, my friend and partner, Dr. Muhammad Athani. But this patient was paraplegic. You can imagine the amount of resources that this patient had over a few weeks in terms of wound care and daily dressings to get him ready for grafting. So this was a very, very huge challenge. This is a very interesting case, gunshot wound to the right thigh, uh, unstable femur fracture, but I wanna show you how people get transferred to the, uh, to the OT. There's no trolleys for transfer. This is his uh, uh, fracture right there. And this is the injury that we did. Uh, he, he had lost distal uh, pulses. You know, uh, this is the complete transection of the superior SFA into the profound. We're doing a uh, uh, temporary vascular repair uh, for uh, fixation on some definitive vascular repair. So again, no vascular surgeon was available on site, so we ended up doing a shunt, as you can see here. Uh, we established the distal flow and distal pulses. Ortho did fixation, and then we shifted this patient to the European hospital where there is definitive vascular surgery uh, for help. This is a very, very sad case. A patient uh, was targeted by a drone missile while he was in front of his home. And I will show you the video. This is a very traumatic video. You can see his lower limb below knee is completely shattered. He had multiple sharpness across his, his torso, hands, and, and, uh, and penetrating injuries. And you can see this is, this is the, the full OT working, uh, orthopedics working at the lower limbs. Uh, general surgery working at the upper limbs and also also working on the, his hand. So this is a extensive utilization of resources and eventually a uh, patient actually uh, 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 did well with daily dressings. You see here one of one of the main the challenges that this is electricity is limited and this is one of the daily dressings for him that we used to do and we had maybe one hour without electricity. We had an ortho working on his stumps and we have two general surgeons working on his on his abdomen trying to do the daily dressings and wash out. This is a gunshot wound uh, to the uh, abdomen uh, by a sniper. The patient was uh, trying to get uh, this, uh, reaching the AIDS uh, uh, issues. And you see here, the liver is completely shattered. And you can see here, this is again, uh, uh, I was lucky to be there having a hepatobiliary background. We did really manage uh, his liver injury. Uh, 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 as you can see here, initially by packing, then by definitive bleeding control. And I would love to ask uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Kali and Hani, with this extensive liver injury, as you can see here, what options you have other than just fixing the bleeding? Would you consider doing something more than that? Absolutely. I mean, I would pack this. If it, if it was massively bleeding, you would need massive transfusion protocol. You would need an interventional radiologist to potentially stop bleeding that is much deeper, significantly increases survival. He needs intensive care. He needs um, correction of his coagulopathy, um, hypothermia, resuscitate him. And once he's physiologically stable, then I would take him back to the operating room. So he needs a lot of resources. Okay, Abdullah, what do you think about this patient uh, while you are in Gaza? He, he he came to me unstable, and you were the anesthetist on this case. So with this massive liver injury, would you would you would you agree with Dr. Kaali about what we need to be done and what we actually did ourselves? Uh, hello, sure, I would agree uh, with her uh, if we were in normal conditions. But according to the conditions we, we had in Shuhada al-Aqsa, even we can't do simple investigations to the patient. Uh, we just saw the patient and we we've anesthetized him on the spot. 
uh, you've done the surgery, we corrected the hypovolemia, the, the infection the patient is having by giving antibiotic. We've done the anesthesia management protocol for him as much as, uh, as we can do. And uh, we were very lucky because uh, the patient after three hours uh, was extubated and was took. And even we, we didn't uh, transfer him to the ICU as I remember. So, uh, Dr. Kali, uh, no massive transition protocols available. We have only blood uh, available, no platelets and, and no, fresh, no fresh frozen or limited fresh frozen. The actual machines that do platelet and fresh frozen were broken in the hospital. Uh, ICU beds are not available. There are only 10 ICU beds and they're full all the time. They're full all the time. So you have to really uh, do what you can do in these kind of situations and uh, and then literally these patients get extubated and they go to the floor with only their family, to be honest with you, are the main caregiver in terms of post-operative care. Unfortunately, we tell the family, you have to keep looking at his urine output, tell us if there's any problems because this hospital that we worked in, typically it's a 200 hospital. There were like around 800 patients in this hospital, in addition to around maybe 10,000 refugees across the whole hospital. So basically resources are very, very, very limited. My question for you, Hani, uh, doing, again, you did a great surgery, you stopped the bleeding. I did, as you can see here, packing with the, with the gel foam and surgery cell, and then did the big suture liver stitches. What kind of complication do you expect and prepare yourself for this kind of case? So a lot of complications, um, uh, Dr. Osama. I mean, uh, uh, my heart goes out to the, to, the, to the victims and also to the medical team operating in such uh, austere conditions. Um, I totally agree with Dr. Kali. If, if we had the, the, um, the, the, uh, the appropriate uh, resources, but in obviously in case, uh, this does not apply. So what I would do is exactly what you have done. Suture, try, try to suture whatever I can suture. Um, uh, you can also, uh, what I would do also is maybe crank the, uh, the cautery to max and try just to burn the, the, the raw surface of the, of the liver as much as possible. Um, pack it with either uh, surgery cell if you have or snow or whatever um, uh, hemostatic agents uh, available. If not, uh, you can actually suture the momentum just to, uh, to, uh, to pack the uh, surface area. Um, complications, tons of complications from this injury, a uh, bile leak, uh, bleeding, infection. Um, and also he had, uh, he, had, he had a small bowel injury. I agree with you. So we have to prepare for bile leak. Unfortunately, we just drained the, 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 the area very well. And guess what? He definitely get a bile leak. And guess what? You don't have an, an endoscopy to do an ERCB. So this patient, as we speak, still in the hospital with a drain, getting bile out, waiting for a transfer outside Gaza for an ERCB. So you would imagine how is the situation catastrophic for these patients. He, he Thank God he was saved by this very major injury where his liver is shattered completely, as you could see. But again, he's still dealing with a complication that could have been uh, saved uh, 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 with an ERCB. In retrospect, I would myself, as a hepatobiliary surgeon, considered a formal resection here, to be honest with you if the situations happen. But in, 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 in a situation like this, maybe if we did the extensive debridement and, and uh, resection, maybe would be a better option for him dealing with the resection rather than a shattered liver with a bile leak. So that's something I would have considered in retrospect myself after learning that, guess what? There's no ERCB for bile leaks. Hussein, do you have a comment? Uh, I think Dr. Fali has a question and I'll go after. Yeah, no, I just wanted to um, say kudos, you know, even in the best of circumstances, even in um, the most abundant resources, these patients don't do very well. They do have bile leaks. They even uh, with access to all the resuscitation, access to ERCP and management of their post-operative complications, these patients have prolonged hospital um, stay and uh, really bad complications. So with, given the limited resources that you guys have and given the situation, mashallah, um, just kudos to the entire team. Um, and I hope the patient continues to do well. It's impressive, mashallah. Okay, so this is another uh, interesting case. Uh, six in the Before morning. you go, Dr. Osama, sorry, yeah. uh, just trying to catch up with the, some of the questions. So there is a quick question from Maria. 
Have you seen injuries caused by the internationally banned butterfly bullets used by the occupation forces, the Israeli occupation forces? Well, I'm going to show you a bullet that I took out of the uh, of the patient abdomen here. I'm not an expert of uh, type of bullets, and actually it took me a time to realize what kind of bullet is this that you can see here. So this is a patient, uh, five uh, in the morning, we we got a weight that we have a gunshot wound to the abdomen. This patient was sleeping in her in her, in her her tent, uh, and a tank starts firing uh, 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 on these tents, like at five in the morning. You can see Dr. Abdullah as he's the solo anesthetist working with me there. And this is uh, 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 Iyad, he's a second year surgery resident helping me with this. Uh, as you can see, this is the bullet. But again, this patient had a bullet uh, in the torso from the left flank, and it was settled in the right upper quadrant. So kidney, uh, splenic flexure, DJ, uh, transfection of the stomach, as you can see here, as well as liver laceration. Show you a video of, uh, of uh, the DJ uh, lacerations. And, and then one more thing, if you, if you see here uh, on, the, on the surgical drape that we use, so we have no surgical drapes, no surgical drapes the entire stay. We used to do gowns, and sometimes the sheets that actually cover the gown. So this is again a hospital that serves 800,000 population, two OR only, no resources, no uh, disposables because of the Israeli siege on these uh, 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 hospitals. No, nothing. Uh, actually at one days we did not have even abdominal swabs and four by fours. So they don't allow anything to get in ex at all uh, in terms of in terms of you know AIDS by through the WHO or the Red Cross. So again, five in the morning, we wake up with this call. Uh, actually, the one who's taking the video is uh, my friend Muhammad. You see Abdullah by himself out there. You see here, this is uh, the uh, uh, some bleeding at the root of the mesentery uh, that I'm trying to control there. Severe <clears throat> bleeding, small bone proximally from the DJ junction. You can see my voice. Uh, it's waking from the north. Can you see? I see this is the whole yeah. proximal small bowl from the DJ completely shattered. Uh, right and then we have colon, stomach, kidney, and liver. You see the stomach is completely transected. So we did proximal resection of the of the of the uh, DJ and did an end to end anastomosis to the left of the SMA. And we did a uh, uh, repair of the kidney using uh, hemostatic sutures over uh, gel foam and, and stitches. We did colon resection, anastomosis, and we did a repair of the stomach, as you can see here, as if this is the proximal stomach and this is the antrum. So we did an anastomosis uh, as you do a, a gastrogastric anastomosis. And uh, uh, this is this is the video explaining of what kind of uh, specimens. So this is the colon. And this is the small bowel, the proximal small bowel. And this is the tank missile, uh, the tank uh, 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 bullet that we took out of the patient abdomen. This is the proximal small bowel. This is the corner, left corner. So, uh, Hani, again, you can see me and Abdullah in this picture waiting uh, for maybe two or three hours after the case, keeping the patient extubated, trying to warm him up in the operating room and trying to do an extensive resuscitation. Abdullah, can you comment on this case? Yeah, as uh, as you said before, uh, it was a major trauma. We we had difficulties in, uh, in anesthesia drugs in uh, equipment uh, anesthesia such as uh, suction, such as uh, bear hugger, such as blood products. Even almost everything we needed was difficult to obtain. But uh, at the end, we managed to to let the patient survive, uh, survives till, uh, till the end of the cell. Alhamdulillah. So this is the, the trolley that we had. Again, this patient, they tried to push us. They need the operating room to transfer to the floor. <clears throat> Again, we and Abdullah disagreed and we kept her intubated for maybe two hours in the operating room, trying to do an active resuscitation there. You see, it's me, me and him only. 
the local staff are so tired, they just went home and we stayed with this patient was until she was uh, uh, ready for extubation, her temperature was corrected and uh, we had hypovolemia was corrected. And then again, this patient moved to a floor, not a regular floor, her room, you have like 10 other patients with her in the same room. And you would see what kind of, you know, uh, follow up this patient would have. And thank God, okay. eventually she went home. Of this case, she had re-bleeding from her left uh, uh, injury, uh, sorry, from her left renal injury. And, and after doing this, uh, uh, where we had the questions about whether we need an intervention radiology and transfer her to the uh, European hospital where she might have bleeding, that lucky she had actually, uh, 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 alhamdulillah, she had uh, stopped her bleeding. She got three, four units after surgery, one week after surgery, actually this happened the re-bleeding, and then eventually she did well. She went home again, alhamdulillah, without any problems. Any comment, Dr. Kali and Dr. Hani? Yeah. Um, from the bullet, uh, I can see that the bullet did not change shape. So um, this is actually an illegal, uh, illegally used bullet. Uh, those, those are sniper bullets uh, that do not change shape once they enter the body. The usual bullets, when they enter the body, they, they flatten out. So the damage is is limited, but these these are the one of the illegal ones uh, used here. Obviously, um, I, I, this is just a small uh, fraction of the atrocities uh, uh, committed there. Um, the other thing is, uh, did 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 you um, did you notice the renal injury intraoperatively? Yes. Uh, was nephrectomy done? So I did, uh, it was like a, like a major, uh, maybe a good laceration. So what I did is cautery and then uh, surgery cell and gel forms and then put big sutures and tighten them as, as we would do sometimes partial nephrectomies for, uh, for uh, 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 renal tumors. So in retrospect, actually I had another case later on uh, uh, with the penetrating injury to the kidney and I did a nephrectomy regardless. I did not, you know, run the risk of having re-bleeding and the issues of intervention radiology. So it was a learning experience as we went and going on with cases. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we can learn a lot from this case. Uh, one of them is uh, once, uh, you know, with all the limited resources and you don't have any blood transfusion resources, um, is to eliminate any source of re-bleed, uh, which, uh, which is basically nephrectomy. But I'm glad uh, you guys, uh, uh, you know, insisted on keeping the patient in the OR rather than shifting the patient back to the to the ward uh, so that you can detect any further deterioration in the hemodynamics. Dr. Kali? Yep. Yeah, how did you manage to re-bleed? So it was actually five or six days while she was in the floor, just blood transfusions. She just, mm -hmm. you know, we did the blood transfusion. We stopped the uh, anti anticoagulation that she was on as prophylactic, she was on prophylactic anticoagulation. And we started to seriously talk about transferring her to another hospital where she might have intervention radiology, but eventually her hemoglobin stabilized and, and she went home. Yeah. Uh, and how about the cool Sorry, question, like the any, injury to the yeah. any injuries to the collecting system and how were you able to evaluate that? Did you leave a drain or anything? We left a drain, yes. And, and actually was, I did, you know, it was literally a parenchymal injury. I didn't, I didn't, you know, it was not through the uh, hilum or any, anything where I could, you know, uh, justify uh, uh, not leaving it. So, yeah, we, it was not, did not reach the hilum and it was just a parenchymal injury. Perfect. Okay. So, so we have in the, in the uh, attendees, uh, Dr. Mark uh, Perlmutter, um, he's actually in Gaza, he's one of the senior orthopedic surgeons. I'm, I'm going to allow him to talk if that's okay, because he has very limited connection. So see if he's able to talk. And then Dr. Abu Harb also, he's the chief of orthopedic at uh, Al-Aqsa yes. Hospital, was here in a second. So let me just see if he can join us. Did you uh, did you uh, upgrade him to a yeah. panelist? Yeah, he's he can. I think he can. Dr. Can you hear me? Yes, can we, we can. Thank you for joining us, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Would you like to... You know, just give us and you know your experience. I know you have a lot to say, but like maybe in five minutes, uh, what you've sure. seen so far the, and your message to everybody who's joining us today. First of all, the the overwhelming carnage that goes on here is directed at uh, the at communities. 
fire starts uh, it, at the beginning of iftar. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with that, it's the, when Muslims gather for evening prayer. That's when they're most concentrated and most vulnerable. Um, a lot of the explosions are air explosions uh, just to intimidate all night long. It's a completely evident dehumanizing process. And, and the Israeli uh, IDF, uh, the Zionists, are clearly uh, dehumanizing, and that's their goal. That's been their goal for the last 100 years, 50 years, I should say. Uh, and the ultimate way to dehumanize is to take the human life. Uh, and that's clearly evident here. Uh, I've seen babies that were shredded like paper, 14-year-olds uh, uh, with sniper uh, with two sniper bullets in them. Um, so you can't say that's an act. Vans being struck in their center of their uh, hoods, two kilometers apart, are an accident. Um, the bottom line is these are deliberate snipers by extremely well trained. Nobody in the world is better trained than their snipers. They're not better than anybody who's superb, but they are superb. And you don't shoot a three year old in the forehead and the abdomen with two sniper bullets um, and, uh, uh, and, and call that an accident. Uh, th this is deliberate targeting. Uh, this is genocide defined, and this is coming from uh, an American surgeon with Jewish heritage. Um, so, uh, and I think it's clear that um, that part of this process is that the, it's the politic of Israel, and when we see the uh, online uh, process that's going, when we see the online process that's going on with um, uh, Israelis protesting this. Uh, and the American government can, uh, offering to fund it, 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 we have to realize that this is a governmental issue, that the, the average Israeli and the average American is actually pro-Gaza. Um, uh, they're pro-end of war, they're pro-peace. It's really the right-wing governments in both of these countries, and even uh, in, in the German parliament uh, uh, and the Bundesphere follows what America does. And so since they combined fund Israel, 99.9% of their military, just those two countries, mine and Germany, uh, with Germany following the lead of the United States, uh, if we could control our right wings and if Israel could control their right wing and uh, eliminate the effect of Zionism, we can get a two-state solution. Uh, but that's way down the road, and I think the short term is realizing uh, that we have to call out uh, the Zionism, we have to call out the carnage and that that, that, that politic uh, uh, causes. And I've done that. I wrote letters to every single senator in the United States. Not one, not even Chuck Schumer uh, got back to me uh, on this. Uh, and of course, you know about his protest, uh, you know, in front of Congress. Um, it is uh, my TikTok, or rather X account, was closed because I actually revealed genuine photographs of babies with exploded faces and babies with gashes across their cheeks and babies with bullet holes. Okay. I think Dr. Belmater is trying to reconnect, but, you know, <clears throat> knowing that the uh, you know, internet is really bad in, in Gaza right now. So um, it's very noble of you, Dr. Mark. Yeah. So very nice of uh, thanks. Uh, uh, we can maybe you can go uh, with, with your plan. Uh, yeah, or we have actually Dr. Ayman uh, Harb. Uh, yes. If you want to comment, and of course, thank you, Dr. Perlmutter. Really coming from from your heart, you can tell that. I uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, Dr. Ayman Harb, uh, are you able to? To speak, do you want to try to unmute yourself? Assalamu alaikum. Are you hearing Walaikum me? Salam, Dr. Ayman. Of course, go for it. Assalamu alaikum. Salam to Bhir, the Kabbalah, the Kusah, and Mel. Dr. Osama, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Hani, Dr. Kali, Dr. Said. Mostly I know you and you know me. Uh, it's a, a great job that we, we, we what, what they, our doctors, colleagues, from the, the our hospital in Shoda uh, Laksa, as I am orthopedic uh, uh, head of the bar. Uh, 
I think we have the same problem with Dr. Harb. Uh, uh, college, uh, something, and what we had actually in the land, something else. And uh, Dr. Osama and Dr. Abdullah, uh, they are already experienced in that. When you have nothing, but you must to do everything. Uh, the problem that uh, surgery is need, uh, I mean, not not a traditional what we have in general surgery or in orthopedic uh, branches. We need to emphasize to confirm that our knowledge to increase it about the war surgery that you need to have to deal with the gush of patients around in our in every attack around two hundred plus and minus. What our anesthetist can do with what our general surgeon can do with. What can orthopedic also can do it because you you don't you don't have a choice to, to choose your patients. You have a, a, a black box and you must unbox the patient to have um, a lot of surprises. Uh, I, I think that we have to increase our knowledge in the war surgery. This is the point from my. Side. Well, thank you, Dr. Harp. I think, you know, and probably the other panelists agree, I think the experience that you have, Dr. Ayman, and other like uh, surgeons in, in Gaza, many, many of us, many, many surgeons across the globe, you know, have zero like kind of knowledge and skills compared to what you guys have. So kudos to you and all the, uh, not just the doctors, all the healthcare workers who are still working at those hospitals who, like even before the war, uh, I'm from Gaza and I know uh, a lot of what's going on, like the, you know, no salaries or very minimum salary, um, no like kind of uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, courses to kind of improve like the kind of the skills, n no access to anything, really like even the um, the kind of mental well-being is not a thing in, in, in Gaza when you're you know, when we compare what we see in uh, here in the U.S. and other countries where the people care about, like, well-being of doctors and improving their, um, you know, emotional aspect and all of that, that's not a thing in, in, in Gaza. So um, I appreciate you joining us. Um, Dr. Osama, I guess... Uh, do you, you yeah, still I, have... Have, I have a few cases to run. Again, okay. I'd like to thank uh, Ayman for being with us. Ayman uh, and his team, the orthopedic teams, Actually, you can't imagine the amount of work that they're doing trying to serve their people uh, over the last uh, six months. What we have seen on, on, on ground for one month, these people, they are nonstop, 24 hours seven. The orthopedic teams is working. They have a one assigned OR that it's full all the time. You, 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 don't, you never see this room empty at all. And, and you will see these orthopedic consultants. I have some videos where they are the one who's running the, the C-arm for the patient. They will do the C-arm and then check the X-ray and then they come back to arrange the C-arm. So again, these people, these people, uh, what they've done, uh, I think, you know, they are, I think the work they're doing is just a legendary work and people will continue to, to talk about it forever. And hopefully we were an eyewitness for this thing and we could spread their, their word to the world as we are doing right now. So this is a very, very sad injury, very, very sad injury. And I'm sure you all heard about uh, uh, tanks running over uh, people. So this patient was sleeping in her tent and basically a tank ran this over lady, the tent in uh, Khan Yunus. Tank she was lucky to have to be in an area where there's sand. So this, her, she, her body went underneath the sand as, as the tank ran over, over this patient. Okay, this is one of the patients that was sleeping in a tent where the tank had run over them. You'll see the magnitude of this soft tissue injury that this patient has. Dr. Kali, young female, healthy. She had this extensive soft tissue injury. Uh, what would you think an optimal uh, management for this patient? Uh, I, I can't even imagine. Um... I mean, we don't we don't see this. I mean, we see this from burns. Um, optimal management is she needs you know tissue coverage. She's lost everything. Just you know, just has muscle 
um, up here, um, I, I don't know if I can point to it, but it looks like is that bone uh, all the yeah. way up to her pelvis? Yeah. And it looks like it, it extends way to her back. Yep. I mean, this needs this, soft tissue. This, this patient had necrotizing fasciitis. So again, our main goal was trying yeah. to control the infection. Again, this tank ran over this patient in an area that has mud and sand. So we had this extensive daily debridement. One of our friends, Dr. Tariq Al-Qasim and uh, an American friend, his name is Judah from Mid Global. He's in Chicago. They used to work every day four hours on this patient in the operating room. We used to book it at around midnight, so we don't have a real uh, daily OR time. So they'd spend four hours every day doing daily dressings. And guess what? You have no nutrition. This patient is in the floor with another maybe 10 patients in their room. And guess what? We have limited access to antibiotics and limited access to pain control. What do you guess? What would you guess this patient uh, outcome was? Now, we, she spent a full week with us trying to save her with this extensive utilization of resources, young, female, healthy. She, she would you know, have videos of her talking about what she's been through, telling us how the tank ran over her. She was awake, woke up in the morning from night and there's a tank on top of her and her tent. So this patient died, actually. We lost her for this bad infection that we could not really control uh, because of the limited resources. We tried our best to transfer her outside of Gaza. And actually, there were like, you know, no, 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 no agreements from the Israeli army to send her outside Gaza. So this is a very sad reality, but you've all heard about what be tanks running over people. This is a clear example of what, what's happening in Gaza right there. Hany, you want to comment? Uh, ju just a comment so for those of us who are in a in a kind of advanced uh, healthcare system where we have access to everything. Can you walk us through when you're trying to, for example, prescribe antibiotics? How do you prescribe? How do you kind of like and what an exact antibiotics do you have? And then same thing with the blood products as well, in case there is bleeding, not necessarily in this case, but other cases. What exact blood, blood product? I think you mentioned briefly the massive transfusion protocol, but that's not a thing in Gaza. If you need like 10 units, you expect this patient's bleeding to death. And of course, you're sur surgically corrected or you're trying to correct that. Like how many units can you get at one time? Is that for me? Well, it's for Dr. Osama, sorry. For me, you know, I believe for blood products, you know, we could get maybe four or five maximum, uh, but we don't have any anything else. Fresh frozen are limited uh, and uh, and platelets are limited. In terms of cultures, we have very limited access to culture. So for a week, you will guess there she had some sort of antibiotic resistance. We had available uh, uh, rosofen or ceftriaxone uh, early on, and then we did upgrade it to uh, 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 Bresma, Mirobinin. Mirobinin. Uh, Mirobinin. sorry, Mirobinin. And then that's it. And then Abdullah actually, he can comment on this daily dressings with this extensive requirements for fluids. Abdullah, please comment. You were one of the uh, last to take care of this patient. Yeah, yeah. This patient uh, came to us as uh, the injury as uh, Dr. Osama described before. Um, she was young, medical free, but with extensive injury. Um, we gave her uh, simple analgesia, light anesthesia, um, and uh, during anesthesia, we noticed, according to the, to her clinical picture, that uh, she is going into sepsis or severe sepsis. Uh, we was alert to that, but uh, from the first day, we couldn't uh, have an ICU an ICU bed to this patient. Uh, we tried to give her fluids, nutrition, even uh, I think that we gave her protein bars that belongs to us, uh, as I think. Um, um, according to cultures and the investigations, we were unable to, to do these things. Uh, so we just gave her antibiotics, uh, fluids, protein bars, and uh, do whatever we can, we can do. We worked on uh, this patient for uh, for about one week, but uh, later uh, she did, she had septic shock. She she was anuric. Even though I admitted her to the ICU with a big effort because there was shortage in ICU beds, 
after one uh, one day they told us that uh, that uh, she passed away unfortunately okay and so just another comment about nutrition um you know i I work currently in a burn unit and, you know, typically when we have like either burn or like an STI or necrotizing soft tissue infection, we typically put the patient on high protein, high caloric diet. If they need more nutrition, we do a tube feed essentially either through an adob pulp or NG or a G tube later. Um, and sometimes TPN, depending on what they have. Do we have, or Dr. Osama and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Abdullah, we don't have any tube feed. We don't have any uh, TBN. No, is no. that no? No, and no. Then she, again, tell you she was in the floor, and people like the surgeon Judah from uh, Chicago. He used to bring her his his own protein bars, trying to uh, improve her nutrition. Because really, there's very very limited resources for all these supplements, unfortunately. This lady, uh, the tap. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting case. Uh, uh, again, this is the patient, uh, blast injury, sharp nails penetrating his uh, torso. Uh, 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 this is the this is the back. So he had a positive fast. The the night team did laparotomy and they found a diaphragmatic injury and did a splenectomy for him. And during our morning round, doing a dressing change for him, and you'll see this. Video. You'll see this sucking chest wound. You know the night team did not pay attention to the uh, that the chest is open here, so we had to do a, a mini thoracotomy and did a lung with resection for a lung injury, and we did repair his diaphragm again from above. Uh, any comment, uh, 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 Dr. Kali, about this case? Oh, good, good catch on that um, sucking chest wounds. I mean, how often do we see that? Yeah, right, we don't. We don't, we don't, we hardly ever see that uh, here. So again, um, for medical students would be a great case uh, to see what sucking yeah. chest wound looks like. Hani, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that also draws, I mean, we, we're, we're learning here from this. We're learning how to deal with things with limited resources uh, and also appreciate the, the resources that we have already. Uh, and also another thing to learn from this case is with, uh, with blast injuries and shrapnel injuries, you have to be systematic in your approach and examine everywhere so that you miss some things, you know, you will get derailed and uh, your attention will be derailed uh, to uh, a more serious injury, but you, you, you would miss stuff if you don't, if you're not thorough. I mean, of course, the team is very tired at the end with all the limited resources. So the error or the missed injury rate will be much higher and that's uh, expected. But I'm just talking about the learning points from this case is uh, just a detailed examination, a systematic examination of penetrating injury and don't get uh, a side side uh, tracked by the main injury. And I yeah, and if I add one, yeah, one more comment, ahead. one more comment. I mean, one of the things that we have I mean, when, when you when you have plenty of resources is even in uh, emergencies like this, where we think the patient needs, uh, you know, you, we do damage control surgery. Uh, we, you know, we pack them, we resuscitate them, we put them in an ICU. The next day, the patient goes back to the operating room. It's either he, they're either being operated on by the same surgeon who's now rested and more focused or by a brand new team who's also rested and can systematically go through um, all the injuries and find anything that's missed. So, and even in, in that case, even if we find it, it's not considered a missed injury because we planned a second look um, a laparotomy or a thoracotomy. So this, Within this hours two points that Hani and Kali right. had brought very, very interesting. I, I totally agree that uh, with this overwhelming number of injuries, the really exhausted and 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 uh, uh, tired staff, that you would really miss a lot of uh, injuries. And and this is an, a, a, a clear example. And in terms of damage control, to be honest with you, I've tried it only once uh, with a gunshot wound. I didn't put this case here, gunshot wound to the abdomen and the uh, uh, pelvis, where he has a huge bleeding from the pelvis that I could not stop. So basically that, and then I had to spend so much effort trying to convince the ICU to accept this patient in their only bed that they have. Uh, he was young, around 17 year old male, gunshot wound to the pelvis with severe bleeding from the bone. He had rectal injury, sigmoid, small bowel injury, 
ended up with resection and stomosis and colostomy, and uh, uh, eventually his bone bleeding from the pelvis had stopped. So again, uh, 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 this is really uh, very, very challenging in terms of resource limited area to, to plan uh, damage control. So if you have always to do your best to get these patients done in the operating room, try to resuscitate them with a good anesthetist as much as possible, and then they go to the floor. And guess what? Sometimes you don't even find the patient in the floor. Like I had an example of a patient that looked for him for almost nine hours next day until I found him somewhere in the hospital and nobody had taken care of him. And I had a case where patient died postoperatively because we were uh, quickly extubating them and sending them to the floor. So again, in this resource limited area, you go through a linear curve early on, but once you get catch up with the whole things, you become very vigilant and very systematic and you try to get the best outcomes in the operating room and not where else. Dr. Osama, uh, just for kind of a uh, question, because we we faced that uh, problem when uh, through the GGTC uh, case discussion. So when when a patient is done like surgically, medically, and they're ready for discharge, and they don't have a home, or they don't have a house. Where do you? How do you deal about that? Like, because you know we all talk about safe discharge planning and you know home, home health, uh, rehab, all of that. Where do patients go after they're done? They don't go anywhere. They stay in the hospital because they tell you they like, have no place to go. So they stay in the hospital with their family. You know, if they don't have a place, they stay in the hospital. We have patients that they have they all, all her family were all their family or her family were killed and they were just stay in the hospital, you know, and just their, you know, people around around will take care of them and, and help them. But How that's about another like reason. Up? What's that? How about follow up? So, you know. Obviously, there is no follow-up as well, like for clinic visit, because the clinic is shut down, obviously, right? Yes. So if, if these patients needed any wound care uh, in terms of uh, post-operative wound care, so they are ready to go home and they need wound care, typically they there's like a, the Doctor Without Borders had some sort of a wound uh, clinic uh, tent uh, outside the hospital. So this is where they get their wound taken care of. And then if they are to go, for example, to their tent, or their area or where they are living, like a refugee camp where they're living, typically there is a, a small clinic in the refugee camp that take care of these patients. And you know, like just to add to that, at Nasser Hospital, it was uh, much worse because they didn't have that wound clinic. So nobody gets follow up and everybody, and at some time they had to kick the patient out of the hospital, stay in the hospital kind of like a, um, you know, uh, courtyard and not stay in the main building because obviously there's a lot of patient need beds. So, so maybe this is the last case that I'm going to show, and then we'll we'll open uh, further discussions by for the audience. This is a patient who had a stab wound. Uh, he was uh, like one of the groups that tried to secure the aids to the hospitals and to the uh, refugee camps. So he gets stabbed by uh, like uh, people who are trying to mob this. Uh, uh, things and you'll see here what we have. Uh, 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 I don't have an actual uh, detailed video, but you see uh, he has a small bowel injury, colon injury, duodenal transection, D2 transection, and you are looking now at the IVC open right there. So he had a very large uh, central hematoma, and you see these are an open IVC. So we had sponge uh, uh, ring forceps or sponge and stick proximally and distally, and we are trying to. Uh, repair uh, his uh, uh, IVC, as you can see there. Now, I'm going to uh, leave uh, uh, Hani and uh, Pali comment and show you the other video where uh, uh, basically uh, 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 I have the final results. So again, this is another video here. This is my screen yeah. obvious? This is a stab wound. Yeah, is my screen obvious? No, we can't see uh, it. Through and through. Okay, just one second. What we have? Maybe while you're doing this, uh, Dr. Tanya Zakerson is asking if it's okay to share like screenshots from this meeting uh, online, like social sure. media. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So sure. anybody who would like to share it and spread the awareness, feel free to share any of the screenshots online. Thank you. I already did on my my. Uh, uh, if she wants even to comment, Tanya, we're happy to hear uh, to hear uh, 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 her comment. 
So this is she the actually game. raised their hand, so she would like to talk. But feel free to, if you want her to talk now, or you want to share what you're sharing right now, feel free to. Let me see. Let's see here. Hi, Derek, so, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hey, Dr. Oh, Zacherson. Yes. Can I just introduce you for a second? Oh, <laughs> sure. Not needed, but sure. Of, of course. Well, Dr. Zacherson, she's one of my mentors, actually. Um, although I don't want to go into trauma, but she's still mentoring me. She's an amazing uh, professor of uh, trauma surgery at U Chicago and has She's she's been to Palestine uh, before, and she's been very advocate uh, on social media and through like big organizations trying to pressure them to do something. Dr. Zakerson, go for it. Oh, thank you, Dr. Elser. You're actually my mentor, so it's all reciprocal, and we'll still work on you to make you into a trauma surgeon. I hope one day, but that's okay. And I want to say, Osama, it's good to see you, and and Kali, you're my hero, as you know. But it's nice to see you and meet you all. I wanted to say, um, Osama, I think it's it's spectacular, these cases, especially like the the second portion of the duodenum on all these injuries you've had that are phenomenal. But more importantly, I want to say the way you have detailed the cases and categorized the cases with videos. I wonder, and osaid has been amazingly organizing a lot of the surgeons going into Gaza. And I hope my husband and I will have a chance to do that as well. But collecting the information surrounding the cases from what some lawyers for international human rights have been telling us, getting the details surrounding the injuries of the individuals does make a stronger case for whether it's genocidal intent, including cases of malnutrition, cases of starvation, cases where populations are not meeting their basic needs of survival, in addition to war crimes and crimes of, against humanity, which do not need intent necessarily. This is going to be extremely helpful, again, not just for the South African lawyers who are still following up with the ICJ uh, trial, but with other trials that are going to come forward. This medical and forensic uh, information, especially video recorded, is phenomenally important. I just want to call that out, not just the surgical genius and and incredible skills that you've all been showing but it's it's the documentation is incredibly important and i love and maybe there's a way osai to have that harmonized but osama you did a brilliant job with that and i just want to say thank you to all of you for your hard work thank you so much thank you thank i agree you. i think this should be published somewhere um i, I think not just like medical articles and stuff, but like through lawyers and stuff. And we can work on that uh, after. So. so again, show you the video of the, the repair uh, that uh, we did for her, or for him. Is it is it there? So you'll see again, this is the stab wound uh, of this patient. This is the entry. He had bowel injury that we did resection and stomosis, as you can see here. And this is, you can see here, this is the duodenal transection right there end-to-end uh, -end anastomosis, and you see here the IVC repair. Uh, this was done by me and my friend, uh, uh, partner, Dr. Muhammad Athamne. And, and I know surgeons on the panel would understand what uh, this major IVC injury means in a resource-limited area. And uh, uh, Kali, do you have a comment? Exceptional. I mean, this is like, this is a stab wound to the surgical soul. Right. Exactly. This is what um, in residency you're taught, you know, this this is where surgical skill um, is, is extremely important. Right. You don't need any fancy things, just pure surgical skill, um, being extremely familiar with the anatomy uh, and and, you know, basic surgical skills. Right. Vascular injury without vascular surgeon, proximal distal control repair. It, you know, kudos to you and, um, and, and and the entire team and you know, saving lives with these critical injuries with limited resources. I mean, mashallah, absolutely amazing. So my final my final point that the problem of wounds, this is an unstoppable uh, problem. These wounds are everywhere. There's like an MSF that they will do around uh, maybe 20 dressings per day. We are, we were doing around 10 dressings per day utilizing OR times. And I was surprised to know that actually there's no wound vax available in, in the whole Gaza Strip. So we were happy to introduce the wound vac therapy to them. We just uh, sent uh, uh, four wound vacs to the Al-Aqsa Hospital and we'd encourage anyone of you who's trying to send aids to Gaza, surgical aid, to stop sending stabilizers, stop sending ligatures, and maybe send wound vacs 
uh, for these people of Gaza. Because imagine this 30 or 40 daily dressing in terms of utilization of these poor resources. If you had one vax, how many hours and, and, and minutes and, and resources would you save for this patient? So if you guys need any help and directions of sending one vax there, I can help you. There are some one vax with the canister being reusable. So that would make it even easier for, for these patients. And by here, I would finish and I will leave. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. You're muted by mistake. You were, guys, did you hear me? I last, last yeah, yeah, yeah. You, the one back? Yeah, we did yes. hear the one back. Yeah. Um, so you say the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Sam. I really appreciate that. Honestly, like, there's so many questions that we need to ask, but for the interest of time, Dr. Abdullah, do you still have time to present? Maybe can we make it like a five minutes so that we hear the yes, audience? I, I'll try to. I'll try to do to tell you everything in about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, I'll start. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Abdullah Akli, anesthesia ICU pain management specialist. I worked in this field for 12 years, six of them as a resident, the other six as a specialist. First of all, my mother language is Arabic, but I'll try to say everything uh, I witnessed in English as much as uh, possible as much as I can. I went to Shuhada Al-Aqsa Hospital to help Gaza's people during this uh, genocide. On the 27th of uh, February, I have uh, met with Dr. Ayman Hamdan, the head of the uh, anesthesia department and ICU department in the hospital. Um, I offered him to work in anesthesia, ICU, or pain management uh, according to what he needs. Uh, he asked me to work in anesthesia, ICU department, due to the severe shortage in these two fields. Although many patients uh, needed pain management consultations due to major traumas, major orthopedic surgery, uh, chronic pain syndromes they are having, but due to the lack of uh, doctors in anesthesia, ICU, and the uh, inavailability of medications such as painkillers, opioids, uh, neuropathic pain drugs, and antidepressants, he decided uh, that I should work in anesthesia. Uh, that's reasonable. Uh, we want to... I hate to interrupt, but uh, I think you brought up oh. a really, really important point, which is basically when you're doing global surgery work and doing mission work, the first thing you should do, and that's something that you know, I learned personally is to ask what they need rather than to do what, whatever you think is appropriate because, you know, really you're empowering them. You're asking what they need because they know better. They've been doing this for a while. So I really appreciate you for bringing this up and doing that. Thank you so much. Yeah, as I previously said, uh, we just went to me, Dr. Usama, everyone, uh, went just to help as much as possible in any place they uh, would be suitable to us. Anyway, I want to talk about the healthcare system in brief. Regard regarding to the healthcare system, there are major problems in uh, that health healthcare system in Gaza. At any time, uh, these problems can cause complete stoppage of the healthcare system. Uh, there is severe shortage in, uh, in healthcare uh, providers due to many causes. First of, uh, of all, doctors, nurses, uh, many of them was injured during the Israeli attacks. The second uh, cause is that uh, many of the healthcare providers uh, uh, traveled to another places to work in safe places like Europe, like, uh, like America. And now most of the working uh, doctors are newly graduated and volunteers. Uh, Dr. Osama mentioned this before, I'll, uh, I'll mention this again. Uh, these doctors tried their best, but uh, unfortunately, uh, there is lack of experience. They have uh, not been paid for six months. They are doing their best. Uh, these doctors are facing many challenges, many challenges. 
most of them are living in tents. Their homes are destroyed. They wake up every day. They have to provide water, food to their families. They have to solve their families' problems before heading to the hospitals. These doctors are providing uh, anesthesia, surgery to, to complicated patients. Due to the previously mentioned uh, causes, they are unable to provide adequate uh, healthcare service. Uh, I want to mention a small story during my second day at Gaza. I anesthetized a young child for a maxillofacial surgery. Uh, the surgeon, who was a young, uh, newly graduated dentist, he was uh, assigned to do maxillofacial surgery, even though in, he is a newly graduated dentist only. But uh, he was the only available one to do that. During the surgery, the doctor suddenly collapsed. Uh, we rescued him in uh, in another room. I talked to him and told told him that he didn't. What's what's going on? He told me after he woke up that uh, I didn't eat since morning. I brought to him some dates, some uh, some water, and uh, and he he completed surgery. So that was the situation there. Uh, Another problem in the healthcare system is that the tertiary hospitals like Al Shifa, Nasser Hospital, they are almost destroyed. They, there was, uh, in our time, two functioning hospitals only that can do major surgeries uh, to a certain degree, which are Shuhada Al Aqsa Hospital and the European Hospital. These two hospitals are referral hospitals in origin. They cannot cope with the overwhelming number of patients. And the complicated surgery, the surgical cases they are received. Uh, not every special specialty is there in the hospital, as they are not uh, designed for that type of, uh, of patients. Uh, there is also big shortage in necessary drugs and equipment, such as surgical, orthopedics, uh, anesthetic equipments. During surgery, sometimes surgeons, surgeons are fighting over surgical instruments. Uh, another short story notice. Uh, I want to mention that there is about 30 orthopedic procedures are done daily without proper sterility, without, uh, without giving proper antibiotics. And due to that, we are facing high infection and septic rate, uh, which was mentioned by uh, Dr. Osama post -op. This problem caused uh, major complications uh, to the patient, such as uh, limb loss and sometimes septic shock and death, prolonged stay in the hospital, even though we didn't have uh, enough beds from the beginning. Dr. Akhla, just a question about uh, kind of uh, the logistics when when uh, surgeons wanted to, to book a case. Can you walk us through how that happens? And let's say there's like Dr. Osama and another doctor and like five doctors, they wanted to take a, a patient urgently, different patients. How does that happen, given the fact that we have very limited number of uh, operating uh, operating rooms? Um, uh, first of all, we had uh, we had five operation rooms. Uh, two of them are normal operation rooms, and three of them are delivery rooms in origin. Uh, we used to keep one room for emergency surgeries. Uh, sometimes we face that uh, there is emergency orthopedic, emergency surgical cases that comes in the same times. Even sometimes five, five emergencies come come together. Uh, we tried our best to according to what's available uh, to to let uh, to start with the cases that is most urgent. Sometimes. Uh, uh, we had some some patients with the, their intestines out. They they was lying on uh, on the ground, uh, waiting for their turn to enter the operation room. We couldn't do anything else. And uh, and that was the situation. We just we tried our best, and uh, and in some cases due to lack of beds, lack of uh, surgical rooms, and even once uh, the electricity was not available. So, so some patients may have serious complications or die due to lack of uh, surgical theaters.
Thanks, Dr. Abdullah. And then my second question, I know you have a lot to say, but, you know, especially early on when the uh, genocide started in Gaza, there were reports that a lot of patients uh, underwent surgery without anesthesia and sometimes with like minimal sedation. Can you, as an anesthesiologist who worked at uh, one of the busiest hospitals, can you tell us if that was true and, you know, basically just how the kind of daily normal operating room runs with like anesthesia, like what type of anesthesia do you do? Is it MAC? Is it general anesthesia? Is it like without anesthesia sometimes? Uh, according to the time I went there, I start at the 27th of February. Uh, as I heard from uh, my colleagues there, the rate of injuries were, was a little bit uh, decreased a little bit. So uh, at the time I was there, there wasn't uh, surgeries done without anesthesia or done without uh, operation theaters. But I heard from many of my colleagues that uh, they was doing surgeries on the floor without anesthesia. But I didn't face that during my my period. Okay. Please uh, keep going and maybe let's kind of try to wrap up in five minutes. If yeah, that's okay. I, I'll try to be there are so many questions uh, to answer. I appreciate uh, you sharing all of that. Okay. Uh, as we said, we didn't have enough beds in the hospital to start with. Many departments are out of service or almost out of service, like uh, the laboratory, the pathology department. There is no vascular surgeon. As I said before, uh, no pain management clinic, uh, no interventional radiology. The hospitals is uh, overcrowded with patients, thousands of refugees living in the hospitals, sleeping in the corridors and the rooms at the hospital. According to anesthesia challenges, most of the patients are civilian in general. Most of them are women, pediatrics, elderly patients, who are uh, all patients almost uh, came to the hospital, uh, suffered from dehydration, malnutrition, decreased BMI, infections, uh, hypovolemia, hypovolemia due to injuries from the attacks. Most of them had complicated uh, injuries, which I have never seen or ever even expected to see, and they were very challenging to anesthetize. As uh, I previously mentioned, uh, many patients, and we saw with Dr. Sama many of these cases, that's need, uh, that needs uh, orthopedic with the uh, surgical, with the uh, neurosurgical uh, evaluation at the same time. Uh, were very challenging to anesthetize and needed a high level experience to deal with such patients, which is not available due to the lack of experienced doctors, as I mentioned before. Uh, during anesthesia, there is deficiency in drugs, equipments that may, be, that may cause harmful complications and even death to these uh, innocent people. There is deficiency in opioids, hypnotics, muscle relaxants, antibiotics, which is very important. Airway management equipments. I remember that uh, in a day I was talking with Dr. Osama and I told him uh, that I am afraid that some patients uh, may die with me during anesthesia due to lack of airway management uh, equipment, uh, like laryngeal scopes, laryngeal masks, uh, 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 bougies, uh, stylets. He told me just uh, do whatever you can and no one will blame you. We are working in, in war condition. That was the, the discussion together with, with Dr. Sam. There is also a big problem in blood products. Uh, most of the patients are uh, hypovolemic, and uh, we can't uh, bring uh, blood products like uh, fresh frozen plasma, um, platelets easily. Uh, most of the, of the patients were hypothermic. We, we had only one bear hugger uh, in the hospital for five theaters. Five theaters. They was, they were uh, all the time occupied, and uh, and uh, and we couldn't uh, we couldn't uh, solve this problem, the the hypothermia. 
uh, another major problem is the lack of gowns and clothing, which forced us to keep the patient's uh, clothes on them, even though their clothes uh, were dirty, sometimes full of bugs and insects. Uh, many times, uh, as in any normal hospital, we are used to cut the shirts, the t-shirts of patients when they when they they come to the hospital and we, we want to do surgeries to them. The local uh, doctors and nurses told us always no, keep, keep their clothes on them. There is no clothes outside the hospital. If you cut this, uh, this, sh this shirt or remo remove it, uh, the patient may not find anything to dress it later. Uh, we had five operation theaters. Three of them were originally labor rooms, as I said before which were converted to an OR. These rooms were too small. The surgical tables were unable to change their position according to the surgery needed. There were no medical air, no nitrous oxide in, in these rooms. So we used to anesthetize patients on a 100% oxygen concentration, which is harmful. There is lack of ICU beds. There was 10 to 12 ICU beds. Uh, as I remember, they they are always full. Uh, according to what I see, we needed at least 100 uh, ICU beds to deal with the large number of patients. Many patients uh, needed ICU but couldn't couldn't be admitted there. Many patients were extubated against medical rules to due to lack of ventilators and ICU beds. Many patients were left on the OR ventilators due to lack of ICU beds. All surgeries were done without imaging and laboratory investigations. That was something very important. Uh, patients in the ICU, in the in the and before before surgery, we couldn't do any investigation almost to to these patients. So we we depended we depended only on uh, our clinical sense to treat them. Uh, I want to say just a short story. Uh, four and five years uh, old uh, babies came uh, to the OR after uh, Israel attacks. Their uh, intestines were out. Prolonged surgery uh, was, were done to repair defects. After extubation, no nurse was available to take care of them in the recovery room. No recovery beds were uh, available. Uh, I had to put them on a wooden, wooden board uh, in the recovery room, and, and I was uh, searching for their mother or father. I asked for them. They told me that their father and mother was died. Um, uh, no one was uh, able to, to even uh, nurse them. After three hours, I went to see them later. I, I found their mother's uh, cousin. She, she was there by chance. He, she knew them. She told me that when they wake up uh, from anesthesia, they will even not know her. And uh, that was a case of many many people in Gaza. And that's all, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Akhle. Honestly, like, you know, some of the stories that you shared just, you know, break my our hearts. Um, um, to kind of move on, we have a lot of questions. Uh, we're gonna go through some of them. And then we have um, Dr. Athamni, who was with Dr. Osama at some point in, in Gaza. So I'm gonna go through some of the questions. Um, let's see. So question from Hosni, how many direct head injuries? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Dr. Athamni. We're gonna uh, give you the mic in a second. We're just gonna answer some of the questions just to catch up. And then we'll let you uh, uh, kind of share um, in your your perspective in a second. Thank um, you. So, Kosnia is asking how many direct head injuries were reported to the hospital, especially from snipers or quadcopter while you were there? So, really, uh, we had some people following up these uh, numbers. I uh, didn't follow up my, the numbers myself. I tried to concentrate on my numbers. 
but they were like people who are you know, officially following these numbers. But for me, in terms of uh, what I've dealt with, as I saw, like around 20 penetrating injuries, either explosive with sharp uh, shrapnels or uh, snipers. And then this is actually for Tanya. This is the bullet that I took out of the patient's abdomen. It's right there with me. And I hopefully uh, I get to testify in the I. A CG cord and show this evidence. One more thing that didn't she see the people, this is the shrapnel that I took out of the patient back uh, after penetrating his liver, lung, and uh, bowel and stayed in his back. And again, this is a very uh, 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 shrapnel that's very, very heavy and very, very traumatic. So again, uh, they didn't follow up these numbers, but I'm sure the local authorities do have a clear uh, 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 statistics about this. Muhammad actually was one of the one who he did follow the reports on daily basis. Muhammad Atham. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my name is Muhammad Atham. I am a general surgeon. Uh, I was lucky to work with uh, Dr. Osama in Shwada Al Aqsa. Uh, the first case we uh, we operated on, as Dr. Osama said. Uh, we, if you remember the Bashitis, Dr. Osama, yep. I was working uh, on resection and anastomosis of large and small bowel for the kid, and his brother was uh, was being operated on by Dr. Osama at the same time. When I finished, I, I came for help, and luckily, we saved both of them. Uh, Dr. Osama was doing the, uh, the severe duodenal uh, uh, repair. Luckily, both both kids were saved and discharged weeks later. I want uh, really to express my appreciation uh, to Dr. Osama. He's he is a legend. This is the 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 thing I have the word that I have in my mind. Thanks, Muhammad. You don't have to see that to say that. You know, we worked together, and you were a great help for the people of Gaza and for me also. All these injuries, yeah. I these livers, uh, colon did Dudinal would not have done without your help. Thank you very much. Together, Muhammad. together we saved lives, Alhamdulillah. and uh, honestly, Dr. Osama enriched our experience in in Gaza. Uh, I think the main thing needed in Gaza, uh, rather than supplies and volunteers, is for everybody who is hearing, is to call for stopping the war. If this is the this is the 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 biggest thing that we should work on: stopping this uh, genocide. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I have a short uh, story. Yeah, I have a short right, story to tell. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Muhammad. Short story. Yes. Yes, I have a short story to tell. That is rarely found in in our daily lives. It's a story about uh, let's say I don't know the English word, but it's tadhia, ethar, whatever. Uh, I was passing by the ER for like to pass to another department, walking through the ER. There were three kids, one girl and the and two uh, little kids, like uh, seven and nine years old. Uh, one of them had facial burn. The sister was wrapping herself uh, with a blanket because it was very cold at that time. Uh, when we wanted to, and nobody was taking care of them because the, the emergency room was like full. So uh, me and Judah, the, the American uh, surgeon from Chicago. So we just stopped by them because nobody was there. Every, like the the, 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 the oldest kids, when, when we wanted to examine them, everybody was telling us, please see my brother. I, I, I can wait, see my brother. So the girl was telling us to examine her brothers first as they might need, it, uh, as they might need help more than her. She was worried about her brothers than herself. Fortunately, they were all admitted and we dealt with them and uh, we say so we saved them. But this is like a short story about the people of Gaza, how much they care about each other. And I don't think we can see this in, in, in our normal life, in, in, in our normal practice. So again, thank you, Dr. Osama, for being there with us. Your presence was invaluable. Uh, thank you guys for this uh, webinar. Thanks, Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing that story. And it, it does reflect like the the genuine sort of, you know, um, kind of characteristics of the Palestinians in Gaza and 
how they kind of keep going. And, you know, we got some questions from the audience about like the mental support, like both for the staff and the, for the patients as well. I mean, you know, there's no mental support. Unfortunately, people drive their kind of like, and keep going, you know, miraculously. But, you know, I think the biggest thing for them was faith, having the faith to keep going and, you know, not let go and, it's it's the only support. For them. Actually, actually, you said I believe one of the biggest mental support for the staff and the patient was to see people from uh, outside Gaza coming to help them. I can tell you they really, really appreciated that, as Dr. Ayman Harb had, had said, and as we witnessed there, having other people from different cultures, from different, uh, you know, uh, from the Arab world, from different religions coming to help them. They do really appreciate that. You could feel the the uh, easiness on their faces when they knew that you're from Jordan. So you had risked your life to come and be with them and help them. And that's a clear call for everybody across the globe and across the world who's hearing us, that being there with them is a clear, great message for them that they're not alone. And that's what really gives them a charge and give them you know, some sort of motivations to start working again. That uh, I would strongly uh, uh, mention. That what do you think, Dr. Kali? Absolutely. Um, that's one of the things that Said and I often um, discuss. It's 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 really struggle. You know, a struggle to watch what's going on and and um, want to be there um, at every opportunity um, to do the best we can um, to to support them and with the um, with. The skills that we have in surgery it's 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 really it's one of the things I struggle with I've very young kids and um it's if I could trust me in a heartbeat in a heartbeat I would and inshallah um in the near future I will be part of um um with the rebuilding and uh increasing surgical capacity uh so thank you for setting a great example Osama um and and and, and for being there um you know I, I think Another important aspect is the, the, the and one that will have a, a major impact is for us to push for a ceasefire to save the most lives. Um, and unfortunately, that that is one of the hardest things that 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 we've encountered is we see, uh, yes, our political um, parties and our governments are actively funding this. Um, and another thing, I, I actually changed my, my handle. I, I'm no longer a fellow of the American College of Surgeon, Surgeons. And I think this is an important thing to talk about. Um, you're a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Our institutions are complicit um, in their silence. Um, you know, when it was the Ukraine war um, that was happening, uh, our medical institutions were very vocal. Right. They were doing teachings. They were sending um, the American College of Surgeons were sending a group of people to go and help in Ukraine. Uh, they were offering um, stop the bleed um, courses. They were sending supplies. Um, but when it comes to what's happening in Gaza at the very beginning um, of, 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 of this um, genocide, they were some of them have have uh, put out statements in support of Israel. Right. And so I think this situation has highlighted and the, the most recent thing is Atul Gawande, who's also a surgeon, being asked, you know, what's happening and, and, and um, do you condemn the Israeli government for decimating the entire healthcare system? And his response of no, no response and not commenting on it and actually saying this war in Israel and not even wanting to say the word Palestine. And so as surgeons, I think we have. We have. Uh, um, our work cut out for us to establish our own institutions in standing up for humanity, for the rights of, of, of those oppressed, because uh, we're giving our dues and our memberships to these to these institutions that are standing by and supporting and being complicit in genocide. And so, you know, the other thing that was mentioned was the, the importance of these skills to be able to go and and operate on, on on these injuries right being here in the us i i see gunshot wounds and i'm sure tanya um dr Z um, zackerson um is very familiar with operating on um polytrauma uh, our our organizations don't focus on that right these conflict um uh written zones that those are the skills they need so i'd 
after you know hopefully we we um advocate for and push for a ceasefire i think the next thing we need to talk about is we need organizations that represent us and our ethics not politics right not leaders that will stand up for and align themselves with the policies of of, of their governments we need an organization that 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 stands up for humanity and that stands up for uh people not governments not institutions and to teach these skills that are needed to save lives. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. I, I mean, I, I wish that that exists in an organization that represents and advocates for our causes. Unfortunately, the ACS and, uh, and you know, been in kind of chatting about this, Dr. Hussain and Dr. Zakirson, we've been pushing so hard and fortunately the response is below par, uh, bar and unfortunately it's not what we expect uh, from the college. Um, I'm going to move to Dr. Rami Abu Mesmeh. He's an oncologist uh, from Gaza. He's in the US uh, now. Um, I think you have uh, something to share with us. Uh, you have uh, a, two minutes, if that's okay. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Do you hear me well? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yes, yes, we do. So, the, the, uh, First of all, I want just to say uh, that uh, as we were thinking about um, the, the uh, stop the genocide or ceasefire, I think we have we are obligated to uh, move in a more organized way instead of just wishing for that. I agree with Dr. Hussain about we cannot just stand with those organizations who are very vocal and clear about supporting the genocide, and they are just ignoring the unrepresented suffering of the Palestinian. And they keep doing this. And uh, I know we have this doctors again the gen genocide in the United States, but I haven't seen an international uh, doctors against genocide. As a physician, we have the obligation to act morally, and with we we cannot just be sympathizing or feeling heartbroken for these stories and not to move forward or do it as our at our convenience. I know going there and giving hand and helping people in Gaza is a great effort, but we have to make it in a more organized way. And the other, we have to bring these stories to light and do them in a systemic and organized way because we have to let the people know uh, either uh, publication, uh, recording those th things, and not to let this story die. Because every one of you who've been in Gaza have his own story that's hard for uh, him, but, but still it's not being available to the other people. So we just talk about among, uh, among ourselves without making this in an organized way. I'm just trying to see how we can make this effort larger, bigger, at international level. Like for example, international doctors against genocide. And we have to bring this to light and keep going even if this is stopped. Because this is, uh, it, it just destroyed our, what do you call it, like moralities or standard. Our standard, is, I agree with Dr. Hassan, we have to be to walk out of this organization who are uh, very complicit and they are actually called them genocide organization. And myself, I walked out of ASCO, American Society of Clinical Ecology, because it was so mean in, in just representing one side of the story. And we have many members who are Muslims or not necessarily Muslim who are against genocide and they continue to be in this organization. This is need to be changed. And uh, without having an international effort and co collisions or organization, we're going we're gonna to just be uh, not having any impact, or the impact will be very weak. This is in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Abnismah. And uh, I mean, you know, we definitely need better representation. And uh, when I kind of mentioned some of the small kind of organization that have formed since the uh, genocide started, uh, Doctors Against Genocide, that's one of them. Uh, healthcare workers for Palestine. Um, they have multiple kind of uh, um, representation across the states and outside, like in across Europe as well. Um, healthcare worker watch as well. Uh, we've been kind of documenting attacks on healthcare. Definitely, we need all the efforts to um, help with that. Um, I think we have. Let me see. We have. If I, if I can add of one course. more thing. And right. it's not that they're that these organizations are being silent and complicit and, and, and not saying anything. It's that they are actively refusing 
to say anything. I have went to the I went to the highest level of the American College of Surgeons, right? I'm not attacking at the American College of Surgeons for no reason. I went to the highest level. I went to the the um, executive director, and I and I voiced this and I showed them. If you go through their website, they have multiple pages um, uh, contributed to to Ukraine, to the war in Ukraine. They have held um, sessions where they talk with the surgeons who operated. Um, in in Ukraine to learn about um, you know war casualties and how to manage um, you know how to operate in a in, in a conflict zone. They have actively been participating in in calling out Russia. So when it comes to politics, it's not it's not that they are apolitical. Is that they choose which politics they will engage in. And I pointed out this discrepancy, and I and I have a massive email um, chain that's documenting all of this. Uh, to say, what is the difference? What is the difference between Ukrainians being attacked by Russia versus Palestinians being attacked by Israel? Why do you say, why are you strongly political in one instance and choose to remain silent and say the Middle East and not name anybody in this situation? And their response was that we have made a final decision that we will not be talking uh, um, on this topic, that we will not be speaking on this topic. Right. And as a result, I, I removed my membership and I'm no longer a part of the, uh, a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. This is the stand that we need to make. This is a conversation that needs to be had at the highest levels with all these organizations, because what they are doing is they are upholding imperialism. They are, they are upholding white supremacy and they are being selective in the conversations that they have in whose humanity actually matters. Right. This is what we need to learn from this. And this is where we we move differently so that when we form an organization that is international among surgeons, among you know physicians in every field where we organize in a way that we have political power and we can influence these policies. The American College of Surgeons will not do it. And none of these other organizations will do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Thank you. I appreciate it, Dr. Hussain. I mean, you know, it, as a surgical trainee, a future kind of surgeon, it just, it bothers me that my represent, future representation or current representation, the American College of Surgeons and other, not just uh, in the U.S., Royal College of Surgeons, when they when they posted about Dr. Uh, Ahmed uh, Al-Maqadma, who was killed, who was who was given multiple awards by the Royal College of Surgeons? They didn't. They said he died. He didn't die. He didn't have like a cholera. He didn't have like you know, COVID. He didn't die from COVID. He was brutally killed. He was intentionally killed with his mom. So we have to define things. We have to also be, um, you know, consistent with our advocacy, not be selective, as Dr. Hassan said. Um, I don't know, Dr. Zacherson, do you have any comment on that? Because you've been part of the advocacy work as well, um, and you've been pushing those big organizations as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elsar. And also, Dr. Hussein, I really appreciate your comments. And also, the strength it takes to, to you know, um, have these discussions and dialogues with the college, um, because they do wield power. And so I really appreciate you because... You know, it's a time where we're seeing people be censored, self-censored. There's a whole bunch of censorship, job loss, repercussions. I know you've experienced that a lot. You know, everyone is feeling repercussions in different ways. Um, but with regards to the college, you know, I did speak to the head of membership director, um, uh, membership services, and I've spoken to many people in the college. If you actually do a search on the American College of Surgeons and you search using the terms either Palestine or Gaza, you will see four hits under the search engine. And three of the four actually come up before October of 2023, and one is undated. If you search Ukraine, there's 51 hits, as, as Kali said, and they're also um, uh, largely editorials and they emanate from the college themselves. I was told by the head of membership services, which I'm deliberately keeping anonymous because I, I don't believe in doxing or making people feel bullied on internet, uh, things like that. But uh, his response to that was, well, you know, we have so few, like we need to keep a balanced view when it comes to the Middle East. And I said, that's interesting. 
did we keep a balanced view when it came to Ukraine? Like, did we hear a Russian perspective and whatnot? And then he said, well, we have very few members of the college from Russia, uh, which was kind of troubling because then that means we're just beholden to whoever's paying membership dues, as Kali, you're alluding to. And then I looked it up and we actually have two fellows or two members from Russia and two from Ukraine. So that argument didn't hold either. So I think Dr. Hussein hit the nail on the head. This is like, this is messaging from above. This this is not accidental, just like the, the, the bombs and the sniper attacks in Gaza. This is exactly what is happening uh, from direct objectives from above. With that said, I must say, participating in the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, we had a phenomenal meeting. And we spoke about ATLS courses going on in Gaza and in Palestine. And we heard um, from Dr. George uh, Ali Said, I think, I, I'm, I might be getting his name wrong and I apologize for that, but he's the head of Region 17, Osama. And he, yes. gave, a, he gave a phenomenal presentation about what is happening. And we got people excited about saying, Look at the great work that's been being done for Ukraine, because we're not saying don't do that work, mm -hmm. but we're saying that great work that's being done for UK, Ukraine, teach us how to do the same for Palestine. Teach us how to support our colleagues in Palestine. Teach us how to help train the next generation, because now all of the universities are destroyed, which happens under a genocide situation. So we're... Um, exploring ways to really hold the college to task and say, hey, you've done it already with Ukraine. Let's do the exact same thing for Gaza and let's start now. So there's been phenomenal movement on that on that area, but it's come with uh, not surprising, but unusual need to push very hard to do so. But thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zakerson. I appreciate your efforts in, you know, pushing people to do their job, essentially. Um, we have a few questions in the, we're going to go back to the Q and A. Um, let's see. So Helen, I think Helen asked a question before, if I remember correctly about psychological support, which is super important. We're focusing this webinar on surgery, but Dr. Osama, if you can sh share, and of course, Dr. Hani, since you worked in the, you know, in other settings, how important psychological support for the staff and for the patient it, it is and uh, or is it and then um what what sort of mental and psychological support is there in 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 gaza so um, again well you know it is definitely important uh aside but uh you know when you when you are in this kind of uh, situations and you have an ongoing genocide what really matters first is saving lives. You know, that's what comes first, you know, saving lives. And then basically you go. So I think when you reach the mental well-being of the staff and the patients or the psychological support, you're way down in the priorities of what you're dealing with on daily life. It's very important. Nobody disagrees. But if you have this resource limited area, saving lives, trying to get them, you know, in a safe place where at least, for example, this patient with a gunshot wound to deliver. Again, at least he's having by leak right now as we speak, but he's alive. You know, that's that's what's what, what matter at this time. Eventually, this by leak will be managed either with an ERCB or he might end up having a resection again. But his sepsis is under control and he's alive with his family and loved one. So this is, this is the kind of situation. It's important, but its way comes in your list of, of priorities as you deal with these catastrophic uh, injuries and situations. Hani. Um, totally agree with the, with you, Osama, about uh, about uh, the priorities here. The priority is saving lives, but uh, uh, you know many 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 uh, um, many healthcare workers uh, will get affected uh, if they work long enough with with these atrocities. We are human beings, after all. Um, one suggestion is to uh, rotate the, the the healthcare workers. Uh, if there was access for them to go out and then come back again um, uh, in order for them to get out of that, uh, you know, um, depressive kind of uh, uh, scene, um, get rehabilitated and then they can um, uh, travel back. Uh, I don't know how the, the feasibility of traveling back and forth from Gaza to Jordan, for example, um, 
And the other thing is that to increase the workforce, uh, we are all, uh, I think a lot of people are willing to go uh, to Gaza, uh, but they just don't know how. Um, and I'm sure if there is a kind of a systematic way of recruiting doctors and surgeons and anesthetists and psychiatrists uh, to go to Gaza, you will have um, loads of doctors uh, uh, flocking to, 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 to the borders to go in Gaza. So, uh, so I, can, I, can, I, can, I can explain more details on this. So who's working on the ground and how you can get there? So basically, in the NGOs, international societies, they go and abide of what the Ministry of Health of Gaza is requesting in terms of uh, needs. And if you talk to them, their needs definitely trauma surgeons. And I strongly, if any general surgeons would like to apply, he has to say trauma surgeon. Don't say general surgery. So you know some societies would just you know disregard your applications if you said I'm a general surgeon. So we are no general trauma. So I would go with trauma surgery, anesthesia, orthopedic, plastic, and reconstructive, and emergency physicians. These are the five main categories in terms of physicians. Nurses, OR nurses, ICU nurses, uh, uh, they're in much needs. Uh, these are the, the, the seven categories that are the Ministry of Health. So trauma, anesthesia, orthopedic, plastic and constructive, emergency physicians in terms of physicians, OR nurses, anesthesia technicians, and ICU nurses. These are the main physicians needed by the Ministry of Health. Now you can apply through a lot of uh, groups working on the ground. Uh, for us, the Jordanian uh, Society uh, of Aid, uh, I, I had put the name, and uh, you can find it on Facebook and online, for Project Hope, Doctors Without Borders. Typically, they work with people from Gaza. Then we have the Palestinian American Medical Association. They run uh, several missions. Rahma Association, they run several missions. Uh, uh, Palm, uh, Palm, uh, Palm Med uh, from uh, 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 Palestinian American uh, in the UK. Uh, uh, Palm UK, and then uh, Mid Global from uh, in New York and Chicago. So these are the ones that are actually working on the ground. Uh, and I can uh, follow up an email with details of these uh, uh, things for everybody who attended the, the webinar. That's, that's you, perfect. Man. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of applicants, Dr. Osama. Sure. And I'm sure people here attending this webinar is is uh, is is an evidence to that. I also want to congratulate Dr. Hussein uh, for your uh, and Dr. Tania for your stance. Um, I know there's a lot of pressure, and I know that there's a lot of efforts to silence you and to uh, to uh, to silence others who who speak the truth. Unfortunately, we are advancing in the medical field in terms of technology, but we are regressing in terms of humanity. Thanks, Dr. Uh, can I add just one comment if you don't mind? Yes, in less than a minute, if that's okay, because okay. we have a bunch of questions so and we only have six the, the, minutes. This is about our organization now. Is it something that is standing against their uh, statement is an option or is a mandatory thing? And I think it's not okay. We cannot accept what this organization are doing. It's not like we're feeling sorry. What they are doing is is extreme, ato, is extreme failure to do so. Uh, so. For example, the American Society of, of uh, Psychiatry, which is one of the largest uh, society uh, by the number, they have a clear statement talking only about we stand with the Jewish people and ignoring the Palestinian side. It's so hard to break. This failure cannot be okay. We cannot say, oh, we're sorry. Those organizations are representing us as professional, highly educated people, and it's just destroying us. As teacher now to the younger generation, we're going to lose the trust of this generation because we still stand with organization who are very complicit and ignoring the human life and the standing with one side in a very uh, clear way that's really heartbreaking. I think we have to think about this. What should we do? Because all of, uh, every one of us are member of this organization and it's not like an optional what to do or it's, it's a good thing to stand against them. I think it become mandatory for all of us to stand very clear because we cannot let our value go down and exchange it for a membership or for a status. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musma. I fully agree. I mean, I wish we can, you know, 
have a, a quick fix for that. It's it's a it's a long standing problem. It has to do with the racism and the bias in medicine that has been going on for a while. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, the last questions really fast. Um, so question from an anonymous attendee. Um, so how do you make a decision to go to Gaza knowing you're going to be a potential target for a genocidal attack, Dr. Sam? Well, uh, as we uh, said in the beginning of the presentations, you know, we cannot assure safety at all. And again, Duck Without Borders, a place was attacked and there were like, you know, casualties among them. The World Central Kitchen uh, uh, people, international workers, they were attacked despite the pre-arrangements with the Israeli army. And the actual hospital that we worked in was attacked. So again, in our Muslim faith, we believe that uh, when you are going to die, you're going to die regardless where you're at. So your time of death would come, whether you're in Gaza or in Jordan or even in, in the plane or even in the underground. So when you when your time comes, will come. So basically, when you realize this fact and you believe in it, then nothing would uh, make, life would be easier for you. You know that your time of death is going to happen regardless where you are. And that's what actually uh, helped us as Muslims to go there. I don't think you have to believe in Muslim faith to go there because we've seen a lot of Americans, Christians, people without any faith coming to help uh, their their brothers of humanity. I like this guy, this guy called Judah from Chicago. This guy, you know, I, was very impressive for me that he nonstop 24 hours until he got really so tired and exhausted that he was really sick for two days in the bed because he could not stop working, seeing all these atrocities and catastrophes. So again, you just have to take the risk and 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 help your 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 brothers and sisters in in humanity first before we talk about uh, in Islam or in 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 language. So I think there's a, humanity will always prevail, and um, when we know that this 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 war or this let's say genocide had showed the true face of the world that we live in, in terms of decision makers and their double standards against the populations who are feel all the same in terms of when it comes to humanity. We all found out that we were all occupied, we were all oppressed in terms of general people and general populations against this, you know, decision makers who run it by, uh, uh, you know, uh, special interest group and certain lobbying that really cares about nothing about humanity. It's all about money and special interest uh, uh, groups rather than true humanity feelings. So that's that's my my question, my answer for her. Thank you, Dr. Osama. For the interest of time, uh, we have two minutes. So I'm just gonna answer one last question from uh, Makuno. He was asking about uh, Dr. Khalid Asir, who's, who's my cousin actually, unfortunately, so he, uh, to, just to give a background for people who don't know him, he, he is a fresh grad uh, general surgeon. He was in my class. He was the only remaining general surgeon at the partially functioning Nasser Hospital. And he was unfortunately abducted by the Israeli forces. And right now we don't know anything about him. We don't know if he's still alive or not. So unfortunately we have to keep pressuring the uh, uh, Israeli uh, army to kind of release him um, if he's still alive and uh, kind of reveal his uh, his situation uh, as soon as possible. Um, just kind of for the panelists, uh, in a few seconds, do you have any final message uh, for the people who are listening to us right now? Annie and Kali and Abdullah. Um. Yes, uh, continue speaking up, continue pushing for a ceasefire, uh, continue writing to your um, your representatives. Uh, you know, you don't have to be there in person to contribute from a medical standpoint. I think the biggest impact that we can have from afar is to push our governments to stop this genocide. Um, thank you. Dr. Dr. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going uh, to Gaza after about seven days. Uh, I'm with uh, that uh, idea about stopping that uh, genocide as soon as possible. Um, I'll try to help them as much as I can. Uh, I want to keep 
to to give uh, messages to to small children that uh, we Arab, we Muslims, uh, we doctors are going to even risky places, and uh, even we even we are having risk at our lives just to to send our messages that uh, that we are. It's very important to help people there at Gaza and uh, at another any any place that uh, there is war in. Thank you, Doctor Abdullah. I think what you've just mentioned, I've heard that from pretty much all like surgeons uh, or anesthesiologists or doctors have been to Gaza. The moment they leave Gaza, they have this strong feeling to go back ASAP, and they've done that multiple times. So I appreciate you. Uh, of course, first going for the in the first place in, in Ga to Gaza, and then now willing to go again. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think Dr. Zakerson and I we're gonna finish the webinar. Honey, go ahead. If I'm cutting you off. Unmute, honey. Unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? I think Dr. Yeah, Hanny. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh -huh, okay. Go ahead. Tanya. Okay, I just wanted to to just basically repeat what Dr. Hamed said, and in the sense that humanity will always prevail. All of you embody what being a physician truly means. I mean, to show your solidarity, not just surgically, medically, but also by saying like, we need to work to end this genocide is truly phenomenal and embodies what medicine means for all of us. I've put in the the question and answer aside, fivecalls.org, number five calls, C A L L S.org. For those of us in the United States, it will give you the way that you can contact your congressperson and keep the pressure on them to say, this has to end. All the abstention ballots during the primaries has made a difference. You know, of course, war is big business for the United States. We have no interest in peace. We make too many billions of dollars off it, whoever is at war. So we really need to have the awakening as we're seeing of everyone to say, we have to stop this. And just again, what Dr. Hamed said, humanity will always prevail. And I do believe that. And thank you so much for all of you for your words and your bravery. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Dr. Zakerson. I think that was the a an, an incredible statement uh, before ending the, the the meeting. I appreciate you sharing that uh, link, Dr. Hani. In a few seconds. Yes, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Osama and Dr. Abdullah for all your efforts. Um, uh, it, it will all be rewarded uh, to you and your family and in your health and inshallah uh, to the Palestinian people as well. Um, I just want to say that this has nothing to do with religion or race. This just has to do with humanity, and we, we we see that the sympathy, as as our colleagues from the states said, most of the American people uh, side with the uh, with the victims, with the Palestinian people, and against the genocide. Um, let's just keep pushing, and let's keep trying to raise awareness, and let's um, volunteer, and we are all ready to 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 participate whenever uh, is possible. Thank you very much for this amazing uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for saying. Thank you so much. Thank and uh, Dr. Sam, I think you said you're going to share some uh, final messages uh, and like some links uh, to the attendees. Uh, so, uh, so I will I will send again the the data the how to volunteer. What kind of societies are actually working on the ground uh, in terms of what are the needed actually uh, 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 specialities? I'll send it the, uh, to the same uh, on my web on my on our uh, social media platforms. Uh, and uh, hopefully it will reach everyone, WhatsApp groups that, that we have done then. Uh, and again, uh, for me, myself, also I'm planning to go back again. We're, we're really arranging a mission to the north now. Maybe this is the first mission to Kamal Edwan Hospital. Hopefully it will be successful. And we're working on getting the team ready in the next few, few, few weeks, inshallah. Count and Dr. Hamid, Dr. Hamid, if you could also include supplies, because I, saw, I, I heard you said no no staplers, wound vax. So things I, like I believe, that. I believe what, what's needed right now, if you understand, just send wound vax, because there's like wounds everywhere. You know, these people getting daily dressings or every other day dressings, 
and they're utilizing OR time, which is very limited, OR resources, nurses. And actually, you know, I, want, I wanted to show, for example, you know, I can show you uh, what does it mean to, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, an OR, uh, what's the OR that, uh, you see my, my screen here? Yeah. You see my screen? So this is the, what's the waiting room before the wound dressing clinic or OR? You see, you see, you see the people? PowerPoint, we don't see the screen. What's that? You see the PowerPoint that says 30 dressing, uh, uh, daily dressing changes. Yeah, so let me show you, uh, this is the issue, this is, uh, uh, anyway, so you, you see full packs of patients waiting for their daily dressings. A lot of them, they get missed. So I believe one major urgent issues right now is open wounds that need to be addressed with hundreds of vacs. I believe, you know, I've done a few vacs. We're working on getting more vacs in, in the next, and you can easily send them with, with missions, medical missions. So you don't have to be big achievements. That's my, my, my call for this panels and for anybody who's going to Gaza from a surgical standpoint. Thank you much again. It was a great uh, honor to have you, all of you. And we're happy to uh, keep sharing and doing these, these sessions. Maybe next time we'll talk about orthopedic colleagues who are there and sharing their orthopedic experience. And then we'll, we'll, we'll touch on plastic also. So there will be so many work need to be done after, after the after war, mainly, for example, general surgery, stoma cares, and, and, and stoma takedowns. A lot of people with stoma living in Gaza right now, and there's a lot of stoma takedowns kind of, kind of coming after the war. For, for orthopedics, a lot of artificial limb services. For plastic and reconstructives, there's a lot of you know uh, tissue uh, uh, mobilizations and coverage that need to be done uh, for these poor patients, because again, the, these services are not there. And I know there's a lot of people working on this artificial limb uh, movements for the people of Gaza that's right now they're working on it with some 3D reconstruction and 3D printers uh, that are actually ready to to kick in the time uh, the war the war finished. So again, uh, everybody should continue to do what he can do uh, to uh, uh, relieve this injustice and get the people of Gaza back to uh, uh, what they uh, what they uh, what they deserve in terms of dignity and justice and humanity. Thank you very much again. And uh, thanks, Hani, Kari, Abdullah, Usaid, Tanya, Rami, Muhammad for everything. And I have to finish the meeting right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.